Uh, but we're going back, uh, we're talking about DevOps, not an in-depth thing, not a, uh, not a demo specifically, but talk globally about what has changed, what has changed in Sitecore, um, and like what it looks like and why you need to look at things differently than you used to. Uh, and we can obviously, uh, it doesn't look like we have a lot of time, but happy to field any more technical deep questions uh, now or, or after the fact um, that you know, both John and I um, are happy to do it. So John and I work uh, together on one project that has an aspect. Some of this other is another project that I'm currently working on that you'll see some examples from uh, <clears throat> that we have. It's a, it's a commerce project um, that I'm working on for a major retailer of home improvement stuff or something. Uh, that uh, we, you know, we, We've had some challenges and, and some stuff with. Uh, and so both, and John actually has a, a very deep technical uh, ability and, and experience in actually IT itself, aside from Sitecore. So DevOps is something that he's very familiar with. Um, anyway, so that's that. We take a fresh look at it, and I don't know how to control the thing. That's an error down. Or is it's it this machine? Yeah, right. yeah, that's a there we go. Hard. Oh, me. Okay. So about me. This is. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll include this all of this up some. There's my email address, Twitter. I am not a social media guy. LinkedIn, not a social media guy. There's almost <laughs> nothing there. Uh, doing Psychor Group. I've been working on Psychor or with on Psychor since 2004. John, I'm not speaking your stuff. So. <laughs> Same thing, email. Um, it's my LinkedIn. Um, I am fairly up to date on LinkedIn, I think. Uh, not a social media person really either, which is odd because I do tons of social media stuff and search engine optimization and yes. stuff. But uh, apparently, I'm the guy that they're trying to reach and not reach me. So, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd like to point out too that I'm a Sitecore baby compared to Brent as well. I thought six years on the platform was a pretty good yeah, run. We but all are to Brent. All right, so I'm going to pull out. Oh, let, let, so let's uh, agenda what we're talking about. So we're talking about an overview. What are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking a little bit about how we used to do it. Build versus deployment. What does that mean? Tools for deployment, because you know that code, it's a Sitecore, it's all about content. So what about the content? Configuration, which plays a lot into what has changed and what you need to work on now. And cloud versus on-prem, which, uh, you know, some people still do on-prem, but let's be honest, most of those are going to cloud. And Cyclops best practice is all cloud now. Uh, and their subscription is based heavily on that now. Their new, what their new licensing rather for subscription. Um, I'm going to pull out. I'm supposed to do this. Anybody who's seen me talk before, I'm pulling out notes that we kind of wrote. It's not that I need to read off of them. It's so that it curbs time, because otherwise we're going to be here for two hours if you want to listen to me finish talking, because there's one thing I can do, it's talk. Um, all right, so, look at my notes here, what do I want to cover here, so I'm going to go off of that, okay. So, what are we talking about here, overview? Um, when we say, where are you going, Josiah? Uh, when we're talking about DevOps, what do we mean? Okay, or, you know, DevOps is a general word. What we're talking about here really is deployment and, and life cycle of the product. Um, so, the life cycle product, you're going to have your initial creation and your launch. So, you know, what does that look like? You have various environments, you've never had a product before, you're going to build it, you've got to set up as you're developing those initial steps so that you can release code, look at code, you know, get it approved, it goes through its cycle. You, you know, in the modern world, we use tools to do that. Uh, and, you know, you got all these, all these logos up here. You got Visual Studio, and you got Azure, and you got, you know, AWS. It's, it's all .NET, and you talk to Mongo, you have to talk to all these things or use all of these things. How do they fit together, and what does that look like? So it's a life cycle net. But when you've launched it, you're always getting your incremental updates, your upgrades, things like that. So you've released a product, you need new features, you've got a bug, you've got that. You know, what is that process that you go through so that you're aware of, uh, you know, what code have you moved? Uh, where have you moved it to? Um, you know, all of those aspects of it, so that not only you know, but everybody on your team knows. 
You can report up to upper management. So everybody knows where you are in that process. And that's something that you have to do now. I mean, we're not talking about small websites anymore. We're not talking about brochure sites. We're talking about large enterprise level, you know, full web applications with a lot of integrations. Um, and we're talking about moving code. Like, you need to have it so that you have distinct versions of code or in different places so different people can look at them so they can approve them. You have to have the ability to move a piece of code, a piece of content. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces here. And really in the end, when we're talking about DevOps, it's all about quality. It's all about making sure that what you've moved through the process and what you eventually turn online to your end customer is something that works. Because in the end, the majority of the websites out here are commerce related. Even if they're not commerce related where you're actually selling a product, it's you're putting your name out there because you're selling a product. Very few websites and nothing run by Sitecore. It's not like it's free. It's not WordPress. You know, it's not about you know. I really like this specific kind of dog. That's not the kind of website we're putting out here. We're putting out something that costs money that needs to cause money to come in. So you know, quality is is you know the end users. If they don't like you, somebody else is doing something like you, and they'll go there if they do it better. So it's all about that. Um, and, and that's why I mean. In the end, DevOps is like, oh, okay, well, you know, the important thing is building the code. Well, no, the important thing is getting the code through the process. Okay, so I'm actually more involved in the actual building the code part, but I understand the rest of it. And actually, in my current occupation, I've been more involved in some of this as well. So it's a thing. Okay, so how do we used to do it? I'm going to try to talk back here and as well. All right, how do we used to do it? So if you were fortunate enough, to work with Sitecore a very, very long time ago, um, you got this cool thing of unlimited non-prods. And we're going to talk about this. The reason I'm bringing this back up now is we'll talk about the fact that Sitecore is changing its licensing model, especially based around cloud, so that you can have the ability to have more non-prod environments. And what I mean by that is can have multiple dev environments for doing things and QA environments and stuff. And John's going to talk a little bit about what the best practice of that is here in a sec. But uh, early on, early, early, you, you could have a whole lot of pro non profits So you could have them mix and match and all this other kind of stuff. I'm working on a feature. We're going to put it in this environment. We're going on a different feature. We're going to do an upgrade in a different environment. Recently in Sitecore, and by recently I mean about the last 10 years or so, it's been very limited on that. So you have to be very, very concise about what you're doing. The market is opening up more to be able to have multiple streams. And we're going to talk about how that affects things. So back in the day, you used to have those things. But what you didn't have is tools. There are no tools. So developers are responsible for, for managing everything. Which means that, yeah, I know I moved this to this environment. Somebody go look at it and make sure it's, it works. Hey, great, OK. Somebody move it on to the next level. You know, oh, where do we end up with that code? Well, I don't know. I think I put it here and I put it here. That's, that's the way it worked. You didn't have large teams if you go back far enough. It usually would be small teams, you know, jack of all trades for whoever was doing it. Uh, copy and paste. So this is, I actually do know a couple of people that still do this. Wow, okay, we have this, the website looks really good here. How are we going to deploy the production? We're going to copy it, and then we're going to paste it to this server. Okay, refresh it. Oh, everything looks good. Good, we're done. You can't do that. But that's the, oh, sorry, I just left. That, that's the way that we did it, you know? And it worked a long time ago. I didn't, it didn't necessarily work great, but it worked. And again, if you're talking a long time ago with Sitecore, you're talking about smaller sites. You're talking about an individual website, not a very complicated web application that is taking people's money, tracking what they're doing, stuff like that. None of that kind of stuff was, was going on, so it's a lot easier to do that. Um, and I put this in here for anybody that remembers the Prego commercials, anybody, the thing, the Prego commercials, <laughs> is they, oh, the, the mother comes over and says, is that spaghetti sauce as good as mine? Does it have green peppers? Yeah, it's in there. Does it have onions? Yeah, it's in there. Because this is the way we used to do it. When you had your code, everything was in there. Everything was in your source control, including site port. You didn't move the code that you developed over or part of that code to the next level. You put it all in one bucket. You went, oh, here's site force files. I'm going to put those in. I'm going to put them in source control. So I'm locked into that version of the platform. And we're going to put our custom code. And it's all going to be in our source control. 
So when we go to upgrade, we move the site core files in there and stuff like that. That's not the way that you do it anymore. We'll talk about that. Uh, and site core packages too. We'll talk about site core packages later. But you usually dump those into your code too to make sure you had them because that was the only way that you could maybe maintain that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm going to move over and let John talk about some of the aspects that are before, do like a popcorn presentation. Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we so the way it's laid out is that he's going to talk, or I talk, he's going to talk, and I'm going to talk, and he's going to talk. Yeah, so, and now I'm not going to talk. <laughs> okay, so uh, build versus deploy. I know we have some developers in here, so this probably won't be uh, earth shattering to some of the folks, but um, uh, like you said, back in the old day, there was a lot of copy and pasting. There's a lot of um, trying to figure out why the DLL is loaded on your machine and uh, did not load on another machine. I'm trying to get lined up here, so thanks. <laughs> um, but uh, back to versus the old, uh, like the old caveman picture that Brenda had there, we have a lot of, uh, of utilities for that. Of course, Visual Studio just is the, has, has grown and become kind of the, the IDE of choice mostly. Um, unless you're a front-end developer, maybe you're using Visual Studio code. Um, we have Gulp that will let you go through and compile front-end assets and create the appropriate JavaScript and CSS, HTML, markup, etc. Um, we have even uh, an extension, I think, built mostly here internally that's open source um, that allow you to um, like restore NuGet packages and whatnot. And then finally, there's um, a, a lot of different things like uh, Team City, Jenkins, SDS, and many more that can do uh, more advanced build tasks. So, and, and what we're kind of seeing more too, and actually moving into more of this uh, DevOps rather than the old copy and paste, we're seeing, hey, we need to build everything, and that build is focused on really just creating instead of that copy and paste of the, the views and DLLs and all the pieces that make up a website, this is really more focused on putting all that together and running the appropriate pieces that give me a package that I can say, hey, this package is something that I know is a clean, tested, well-written uh, piece that I can then go and deliver to uh, a web server, again, rather than the old-fashioned copy and paste. So this has really enhanced lots of tools for that, and of course, this uh, this is an example. There's I could probably have a bulleted list of about 50 things that I'm sure you've worked on the different projects. Um, but so now that we've had this place, and the, we have um, we've and, and before we're a developer, a lot of times would be everything from actually writing CSS all the way back to copying it to an IS server or executing a PowerShell script. Um, with DevOps, we've kind of grown that and enhanced that, and now. Um, in my opinion, we've kind of isolated that to this build to, to, to prepare and make sure that all the components of what's that are there, um, and then to deployment. Um, and I summarize it race basically as setting a compiled code package to, you know, if it's IIS for on-prem or IS, uh, or to an Azure App Service, for, for example, with PaaS. Um, and then along the way, like we're using Octopus right now to actually do transformations. So we take some of the weird kind of environment specific things out of a build and put it into the deployment, which makes it a lot easier to manage. Um, we have both scheduled in automated deployments. So for example, um, we have set up for the dev guys who can go in and do a deployment to the integration environment just with a click of a button. Uh, but then we also do a nightly deployment every night. Um, same thing with QA. The QA team can go through and cherry pick like, well, I know the guy's finished his feature, we want to test that, so we're just going to pick that and deploy that to QA. And then what we're working on right now is being able to mark QA releases as something that's ready to go to UAT, so we can have a deployment process kind of flow all the way up to, to UAT ready for user acceptance testing, basically with one click of a button. It's not quite the staples thing, but uh, be pretty close. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of different environments. I mentioned, you know, Dev, QA, UAT, and et cetera. So, um, so basically with Build, there's, there's really, and again, I keep it this simple and high level, really basically three pieces you want to look at. You have site core, configuration transforms, patches, different pieces that come into site core where uh, if you want to put in a custom pipeline to delete GDP, GD, GD, wow. GD, uh, thank you, thank you. I got the letters all mixed up there for a second. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, or all those things. Um, of course, you're compiling code, um, whether that's compiling, you know, front-end JavaScript, CL, uh, C sharp D DLLs, uh, all that fun stuff. And then, of course, there's some third-party pieces. I have web forms for marketers, Active Directory integration, um, uh, Widen is a dam that has a package that you have to install, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of get again, we're taking all of this stuff and smushing it all together to get us that nice website package that we can then deploy. And then deploying. And we have Cycle content, um, updated configs and transforms. Again, can do that in build, can do it in deployment. We have compiled DLLs and then JavaScript and markup that's ready to go. 
And then finally, third party pieces that uh, sometimes you can deploy, I'm sure some people use like core.ship. Um, you can create web deploy packages and deploy with PowerShell, ARM templates, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of ways to do that. Um, I actually had, this is actually from a, a, uh, a real project. Um, and this is something where um, the client had Jenkins, um, we probably typically normally use Team City, but they had this, they were very set on using that. So we actually went through and tried to try to kind of document and plan out exactly what that looked like. So in this case, um, prepare, which really all we do is create a version. So that's like a big fancy step that takes about a tenth of a second. Um, there's code coverage and, and making sure that uh, we've actually um, written the code correctly and covered it completely with tests. Uh, we build, run unit tests, generate the package. So what we've done here is all those steps of build, walk through it, run our unit test, put together, and now I have a clean, tested, ready to deploy package that's good to go. Um, I'm gonna show you the bottom of the picture here in a second. So I had to chop it in half because I couldn't see it if we went from there. Um, run through here, we finalize everything, and then we trigger this deployment. And then in our case, we're actually sending an email and then posting to Microsoft Teams. Um, you can post to things like Slack or you know Skype or, or what have you there. So. So then if we look at the bottom of the picture here, so once Jenkins is done with all of its build and everything's packaged and ready to go and we've done our notifications and whatnot, uh, <laughs> we then send the package to Octopus. Um, Octopus runs a backup call and then it does some preparation. It actually installs the code, uh, re republish and re-index to make sure that there's any new templates or items in site or are uh, seen from there. Um, we do uh, automated tests finalize everything, we send another notification, sorry, the first one is uh, deployment started, second notification is deployment completed, and then of course we you know, check to make sure the site's up and running. There. So. Can you roll back? I'm sorry? Does it have rollback? Yes, yeah, so um, one of the things that we, I don't think this feeds in totally, but um, we're actually working around, uh, so we have a PaaS solution, so it's Azure App Services, um, but they actually have a concept of what they call a slot, so if you can imagine, like you can plug in things. So basically, instead of just being like an IIS installation, um, it, it's a service running there, and I can say, hey, I want to create a, a staging slot or a, um, a prepare to launch slot or whatever you want to call that. Um, you can launch to that, check everything out, see if it's still good, and then you switch to that slot, and that slot becomes production. If for some reason something would break, you literally go in and switch the slot back. So you could, I mean, and if we're talking. I'll go really long and say minutes here. It's probably more like seconds as well. So that's a, now that's a PaaS solution. It's a little more complicated with, with IS but, or with on-prem, but um, that's what you say, go PaaS. But, um, but yeah, so that's the concept uh, around that as well. But what about content? I'm sorry? What about content rollback? It, do you mean for like a rollback? Yeah. Content. content rollback. Oh yeah, so that's where our database backups come into play. So what the what and this is a long, very in-depth conversation. So the way we actually do is we actually spin up a clean SQL instance or SQL database, deploy all of the stuff, sync it with Unicorn, and then have a, a clean just like a basically a slotted SQL database as well. So then so there's actually a whole new instance of that, test it against and then we flip it over. And then you just tear down if you don't need it, if everything's good to go and play you can tear it down. So yeah so uh for the project that we are on, for the retailer of home goods or home improvement stuff, um, the we can't take advantage of this obviously yet because so we're doing in that blue green deployment uh, approach. We've got processes to replicate the databases and then keep them so that we have both of them running. It's more complicated than having them being able to do it in the past. When we get to pass, then we'll do it. Yeah. And I'll talk about some hard stuff that we're doing as well that makes that really, really easy here, here a little bit later on. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the overview there. So uh, what are some tools? And again, if you're a developer, I'm sure you're probably be uh, familiar with all of these. Um, as far as maintaining and synchronizing cycle content, we have Unicorn and TDS. Um, that's a debate about which one you like better. Um, one's one, free. One's free, one costs money, but it has some cool things, you know, back and forth. So um, right now we're using Unicorn. I've used TDS on many projects. There's, I think, pros and cons of, of each. Which was the free one? Uh, yeah. Unicorn. And then, of course, uh, just just for fun, I put it on here. You can you can actually go in and click on an item and create a package and yeah. and literally dump dump it out if you want to. Do, do everything manually if you really want. But uh, yeah, that was that's the old days as well. So 
um, which I already talked about building with Jenkins, Team City, uh, VSTS. Um, of course, Sycor. Cake is more of the solution-based uh, piece of that. Uh, usually, Sycor. Uh, Cake and then one of these other kind of larger pieces will will work in conjunction. Um, I will say Jenkins does do deployments. Um, it just doesn't have as many, for example, uh, cool widgets that Optimus does. Uh, so there's a lot of these that will have overlap in different things. Um, it's just picking what works best for your particular scenario. And then, of course, toy So I said Octopus deployment, Jenkins, sort of, um, Visual Studio, uh, Team Services, and then PowerShell. I mean, anybody can run a PowerShell script and deploy anything anywhere. Cycle has some really good um, PowerShell plugins that you know can let you create resources and deploy things up to it. So if for some reason you have a very specific uh, environment piece, um, again, there's an Azure toolkit for Cycle that lets you do all sorts of fun stuff. So if you really nitpicky things that you just have to do, like, oh, we have to go out to this place and copy in this one file and drop it in, um, then there's a lot of uh, nuances there, so. Quick, quick question. Is, is, yep. How is much, how mature is site product cake, and why would people go and, and use Jenkins or SimCity when people use the, the so, inside mode? So I, I think that it's mature, and I think that it, it, what it does is it takes a lot of things that you would have to do at a, a very high level, like tool set thing, and puts it into a developer scan. So they can compile, they can choose or run a step to compile their own SAS and put it in a certain folder and, and whatnot. So it just puts some things that normally would have to run in the build environment into the hands of the developer. Yeah, and so what, one of the things, just to answer it, is like sometimes you end up with, I mean, I'm on camera here. I would never use Jenkins if I ever had, the, if you gave me the choice, I would never, ever, 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 ever use Jenkins for anything. <laughs> See? However, sometimes the client uses Jenkins, and so you use Jenkins. Uh, I don't like Jenkins. I like Team City. I even like Octopus. We'll go back. I don't like Jenkins. But sometimes that's, that's and maybe perhaps in a project that we're on, the client uses Jenkins, so we might be using Jenkins for something. Yeah. So, you know. Well, here's the thing about it. It's like, it, and we have it running, and we're, to, you know, right now deploying the five environments, and it works just fine. You know, now, again, tool set is your, your choice, I guess, but uh, the, <laughs> I think I'm going to so. where, where does all this tooling sit? Um, so does EPAM have their own infrastructure that you guys sort of manage, and that's where all the server are? It, it, in our scenario, it's on the, it's on the clients. Oh, so. it, it depends on the project. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably, probably most of the time it's hosted at the client side. Yeah. Just for security stuff, they like to have everything in their own. Oh, well, so when you're saying has, you, you don't like sell this this tool? No, no. Oh, no. These yeah, are, no. Yeah, these are, are you know license purchase licenses or, or what have you. So, but uh, um, your clients Azure. Uh, yeah, tip, yeah that's typically the, that's the so, um, so real quickly, I want to talk about um, just some of the different environments that we deploy to, and <laughs> I had to keep this on here. Just as, this is actually just a, a harken back to uh, what uh, Brandon he actually kind of covered the in production, the licensing changing, and whatnot like that. So uh, I'll actually just jump jump ahead a little bit here. So you know, um, he also he kind of talked about this paying for all environments. We're moving to consumption pricing, or at least that's their their goal long term. Um, the only thing I will add on here too is like um, with uh, the site for kind of Azure and Nine rollout and like that, they now have offer a managed cloud service as well. So if for some reason you don't want to manage your own Azure subscription or manage your own resources, um, you can roll it out to to site and they will take care of it. And we have some different relationships where they've done the hosting for it, and we still provide like a level of uh, technical support. Um, they can just handle it all, and you can try to do it internally. So there's different relations that we can set up there, but that's something that's relatively new um, they have out there. So. New and not cheap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. so I wanted to, just the other thing too I want to talk about just real quickly here too, is so um, if if you look at site core 9, there is lots of bits and pieces here, and I can remember you could build site core with like a CD server and a CM server, and woo, you're ready to go, you know, and of course there's stuff under the hood, but uh, I could throw two servers together and, and, and be there. Um, one of the things that I think has has changed with this, and this is kind of applies to the, the CI CD process and the DevOps as well. Is that, um, of course, they're doing lots more things. Um, what they've tried to do with Site 9 is make it more modular, and um, where instead of a server doing like just all this crunchy under the hood stuff, they're now broken out all these different services and pieces that um, are scalable and, and, and whatnot. So, I wanted to show you like what that actually let me uh, jump into it here. Whoops, there we go. So all those bits and pieces have to go into an environment. And this is, uh, so I actually wrote out exactly what we're doing right now and kind of talked through it. Some would be super familiar and easy for you. 
Um, we have a dev integration environment where they deploy and run student tests, and run some automation tests, and of course that's just your daily work, the developers working. We have a QA environment, we have QA testers that go where they create manual tests, run the tests. Um, it's typically, I said, a cleaner environment dev, meaning they can cherry pick releases that they want to push out there because they know uh, a feature is completed. Um, and so typically only clean releases are deployed, that's a, that's a hopeful. Um, we actually have what we what we call an AAT environment or an automated acceptance, what do we call that? Shoot, I just call it AAT, I forgot what it stands for. Um, basically, it's a, it's a, we have actual automation test engineers that have a, a solution that runs code that builds some of the tests. And this environment lets them go out, take a copy of the environment, deploy it, and then they can run all their automated tests across all of the data that's in there. Um, without worrying that this QA guy over here took the widget out that they just tried to test and so forth. And that's kind of the nature of a CMS, you know, I can change everything on a page, and if I can do that, then how do you test the page? So that's uh, something that we were working with. Um, not every place will have this. Um, this is just something that we decided to do with this. Uh, UAT, obviously, that's just user testing. So um, in, in our case, um, this environment will be both our client testing and then they'll be rolling it out to kind of like a, a beta or a public like guinea pig group or, or whatnot. And, and what, one of the things, just to add here, that often when you see this, uh, UAT for a lot of people will also be used for load testing. Uh, sometimes if you've got the budget and, and whatnot, the infrastructure, you have a separate load test environment for just beating on it, but a lot of people don't. And so when you get to that point where you're pre-prod, that's your, the last step before pre-prod, you'll also use that one because it'll be kind of sized the same for beating on so. So then I guess there's like kind of a little tiny here thing here, which is that slot deployment. So there's like, what do you want to call it, pre-prod or prod ready or whatever name you want to make up. Um, not really an environment, it'd be a, something that's spun up and then kicked over and whatnot. So maybe a, maybe a little caveat there. So. What's that? So like a Docker container or something like that? Sort of, sort of, sort of. Um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a service that basically can create a duplicate of itself and let you work with it and then flip back and forth as to where you want like a DNS worker coming to. Oh, so, so, it's, a, so it's an actual almost clone of a product. Yes, it's a, it would be it would be identical as much as possible. Yeah. So um, okay. Uh, all right, so back to you, Brent. Okay. Sorry. Let's try to talk fast. Yeah, well we're <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, twelve minutes. Yeah. Twelve minutes, all right. Let's talk. All right, so code, but what about content? So this the, let's talk. So when we're talking about content management systems. It's all about the content. Um, Cycor is no different. Cycor may be the best content management system out there, but it is often, in a lot of ways, the same as, as others. And this is, this is an important piece here. It's all it's all content. Everything in Cycor is content. So this is like the first thing when I teach people about Cycor is everything in Cycor is an item. So when you open up the little Cycor environment, this guy right here, every one of these is an item. And when you open it up, everything in there is an item. If you go down into the system area, if you go down into the templates, so one of the things about CMSs is that, uh, especially Sitecore, is that the fields that you have, the templates that are comprised of fields that you create items from, I've got a spinning widget, it has a title field, great. Those are all Sitecore items. Sitecore, all of that, including that infrastructure, is all items in Sitecore. So if everything is an item, then everything is content. So that ends up with an interesting thing because you have your code, you have your content, but your code is reliant on your content. It's not like building a standalone application where you define those models over in your code and they're totally separate from the content. No, they're intermixed because the pieces that define those models are in your site core content. So what does that mean? So, so I'm going to talk about, we still have the Sitecore package, we mentioned it earlier. So the, the very early versions of Sitecore did not use databases. Uh, they used XML files. So the very first version, you had a giant XML file, and that was your website. The Sitecore introduced databases, and what they did was they chopped up the XML and they put it in the databases, and what happens is during runtime, you, build up, you end up with a giant XML document, just like you used to. It looks just the same as it ever did. Okay, so uh, a guy named John West, who if you're into Sitecore, you know who he is. He was uh, Sitecore CTO in the US for a very long time, probably their first employee. He developed the package, it was part of his pet project. Um, and it would take 
I want these items out of this cycle guide. I'm going to package them up so I can install them over here. And what you were packaging up was XML, and then it would update the XML that you had there. Um, the packager still completely works. I'll have a picture of it in, like, in a slide here in a second. Like that. You can absolutely go use it. It's great. It's fantastic. But the thing about the packager is it's not really good for multiple environments, meaning that you're not solving, we'll talk about multiple environments, I have these environments and I need content different, content for different ones. And it's not exactly friendly for versioning and source control. Well, I could package that stuff up and I have this little package. And maybe I could check it in the source control, and this is what we used to do back in the day. We would say, okay, I created this thing, I made a package of it, I'm going to put it in the source control here. It doesn't do anything except for the fact that you can reference it. Okay? You don't know if it's installed. I mean, there's some tools and stuff, but you don't know if it's really installed. There's nothing in a, in a, a matrix that's going to show you the, where the code is. But it worked. So, because of the limitations of this, you have third-party tools. And we talked about them a little bit. We talked about Hedgehog. Uh, is the name of the company, TDS, it's uh, Team Development for Cycor. Team Development for Cycor, thank you, brain fart. Uh, and then Unicorn, and Unicorn was developed by Cam Figgy. It's a different approach to a similar thing. He now works for Cycor, um, doing really cool things there, but it's his, it was his own personal project. So both of these, no matter what they do, they take all these Cycor items that you want and they make them so that you can serialize the items and update an instance of Cycor. Why is that important? It's important because these allow you, we can work with multiple environments with some work, but more importantly, they're very friendly for versioning and source control. When a developer creates a new feature and I need to create a new Cycor template for it, you can check that Cycor template into your source control along with the code for your feature, and when you do a deployment, it deploys both of them. So the next environment that you're moving it to gets not only the code that runs the feature, maybe the test content runs the feature, but more importantly, the templates that the features built from can all be. And when you update that template and you add a new field for a new piece that you want that's in your source control version, very important piece that, that you get with that. Packaging is still used, but it's usually used when a developer goes, oh man, I need to move this from my local environment over here to see if it works. Not part of a, a true, uh, you know, thing. Yeah, that's, that's the way it works. So, all right. Configuration. I'm going to talk quickly because that. Okay. So, configuration. What do we mean by configuration? We mean that dev and QA need to have things that are different about them. Maybe they're running the same code. It doesn't matter. They're running the same code, but they've got to point to different things. They have to have options set differently per the environment for whatever reason. Well, the way that you used to do it, especially when I was talking about it, is be like, oh yeah, on QA we need to go do this. Somebody needs to go log on to QA and go click, 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 save, 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 I'm going to publish the change. Okay, now I've got it set the way. You don't want to do that because the only person that knows it's set that way is you because you did it. It's not good. Okay? Now, here we go. So, in the modern world, and I, so this is a different project from the one that John was talking about. It's a project that Seven and I are working on, or the mayor working on. Um, in this project, uh, it's a commerce project. We're talking to Dynamics 365s and the RP and all this other stuff. It's got products and whatnot. We're talking to this Fusion server, which is built on top of solar for indexing and for searching. Oh, we got Cycor. So we have these integrations. There are actually a lot more, but we'll just these three for right now. So the more integrations you have, the more configurations you have to worry about. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And we talked about this. Cycor's more modern licensing that they are coming out with, with consumption-based licensing and cloud, will allow you when you need to, because you don't need to do it unless you need to, have multiple environments. And John laid out the four to five that are best practice. We might have a lot more than that, hypothetically speaking, in the one that I'm working on because of where things, certain integrations are, and we need to test them. So. The more environments you have, the more configurations you have to worry about. So if you put the two of them together, you have a perfect storm. You, in, in modern development, can end up with, up with a stage where you have lots and lots of environments. And at this moment, I have a specific build of D365 that I need to test. Well, that's not part of your dev. That's outside of your normal thing. So you need to have another environment that tests this one. Or maybe I've got a new version of this. Or maybe I've got a new version of these two that line up that is yet another environment. So you end up with... A, a complication when you have this many integrations where you, and if you have the licensing, which we, we're getting to the point where we can have, 
where you need to have more than those environments. They're not part of necessarily the normal development process, but they need to exist. And a lot of them end up being permanent environments, not just a temporary thing you spin up. You know that when you have a new catalog come in, that you need to test it over here, outside of our normal development process. Well, that means that you have different configurations. You may need to say, I'm talking to this one of these, and this one of these, and this. You may need to swap them. So, uh, in any result, so configuration is set both in the file system, which is a traditional way, and I'm talking about an actual file uh, that has values set in it, or in content, which is being very common. It means you open up Sitecore and you see a field and it has a value set. Where is that stored? It's stored in the database. That's not on your file system. So how do you get all of that so that you can manage it without somebody going and manually changing it like you used it? We'll talk about that real quick. So let's talk about file system configuration. We probably okay. Sitecore has lots of configuration files. Anybody who develops on Sitecore knows this. <laughs> and something along the line of like 10 million files last time I checked. There are lots of Sitecore configuration files. Uh, although they're working on trimming them down. Uh, what, what kind of things do you see in those? And we'll talk, I'll show you the examples here. Database connections. What databases am I talking to? Site definitions. What sites do I have defined? Indexes. Where are my indexes? What fields are in the indexes? What endpoints do I hit for an API? What features have I toggled on and off? And so on. Now, if you go into Sitecore and you look, you're going to have most of them are in this little app config, and you'll see giant piles, including folders of all these configs, right? And this is just an example, and I'm going to show you the two things. So, this is a snippet of Sitecore's connection string file. Look, I have this is a database, 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 this is a database. Oh, this is, well, this is actually also really an old test of purpose a database, a database, a database, a database, and an app insights thing. The rest of them are basically databases, although some of them are, are session storage. But in this one, and we went back, so this specific example, we're talking to D365, it's Microsoft's commerce offering. In this config file here, which is standard in Sitecore's uh, A2 commerce, I've got a retail server root. And what you'll see is, in the file, I've got this UAT sandbox operations dynamics commerce URL. That means you're telling Sitecore in this file, that is the D365 I'm talking to. So, this is going to be different in a UNT environment than it is in a dev environment. It's a different endpoint. So that configuration, that value, the file's all going to look the same. That value needs to be specific. So if we talk about content configuration, exactly the same setting, by the way. That's what I'm showing. So it's much more common to see that we're setting values inside of Sitecore. So site toggling for features has been done for a long time. Very common to say, I configured a site settings area that says, I want this page, you know, I want, um, I'm trying to think of something, you know, I, I want this theme. Not probably a good example, but I want, I want this theme done for this market versus that. That's a toggle setting. That's, we've been doing that for a long time. But newer modules and Sitecore features have moved values into the admin. And, and why do they do that? Why do you have it where you're setting values here? The, the main key is so that you can set values without doing a deployment. You can save, you can publish, you can make changes. Uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the um, XConnect pieces and stuff that Sitecore does, those values can be in Sitecore. You can make changes, you can publish. Nobody has to, to do a deployment to make those changes. It's content, it's all, it's all content. In this example, and this is Sitecore's data exchange, and it's data access, and it's commerce tenant. And we've got here Contoso, which is the, the basic one. That's our endpoint. Well, if we look at your authority client, something, oh, retail server URL. Well, wait a minute, that's the, exactly the same one that we just showed in that file. It has a different purpose here, but we have to set it in Sitecore. So not only do we have to set it in the file system, we have to set this one in Sitecore. Otherwise, it, it, you know, it run our problem. So how can you control it? So transform files. We've been, transform files have been used for a long time. Basically, trying to sum it up real quickly, that means that I'm doing a build, I am this environment, therefore I have checked in like these values and I'm going to go and I'm going to update this file because I'm this environment. Um, transform files work very well, uh, but one of the limitations in that is if you have four environments that are known environments, 
pretty easy to do. If you have fluid environments where you may need to stand up for the reason of saying, oh, I need to stand up a new environment here, a new environment here, you don't want to have to go in and update source control to include a new environment just to be able to deploy to it. You don't want to do that because you want your code changes like that to be involved in features not related to your deployment. Okay, so how can you control it? You can set your deployment tools to accept variables that are set during the release, and we'll talk about that. Ideally, you keep those variables in source control. I'll talk about that real quick. Okay, and what, what does that mean? So this is literally from that same project. This is, we're using VSTS on this one, Visual Studio Team Two Services. Um, to do our deployments in the same way that you would use Octopus or um, you can't use really uh, So, uh, so here we are. I've got a D365 app URL, which, if you notice, is exactly the same one from the same environment I took the screenshots for. I also have an OData. We talked about OData earlier. We have specifically an OData URL, so we can use OData for it. And if you look at some of the other ones here, I have. Um, I, I set a user ID and user password, my database, the main bit where my database is. I can control my IP addresses for MongoDB and my Lucid, which is that uh, Fusion. Fusion, thank you. That Fusion thing that I showed earlier, my regular sole URL, my Redis password, and my Redis, uh, you know, for my session. I can set these various variables. So all sorts of them. Well, what does that mean? That means that it allows me to update or override settings by running a simple step. I've got an environment and say, hey, we've got this environment. It's on this build. We need to talk to a different D365 to see if it works. Well, back in the day, you would go, okay, let me go hop on to each one of the machines involved and go, let me go find the five configuration files and update them. Okay, I think I got all of the spots. Let me hit it and say, let me see if it works. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is be able to say, no, I'm going to change this here, and I'm just going to run the one step that updates that. I'm going to hit the step. It's going to finish. It's going to take eight seconds. The, the things are going to come back up, and you know you hit all of those points. Okay? Uh, content from source control can be deployed to specific environments. And what I mean by that, all right, here we go. How do you control? Oh, wait, I'm past there. So let me finish this. It's a separate, separate subject. So uh, one of the other things I want to go back to, ideally you keep the variables in source control. What this means is that in any given moment, I can just set these, and every time I do a deployment, it doesn't. In a perfect world, what you do is, not in your main source control, but you would have the values for these, and you would have the values for these in a source control. Maybe it's a folder in yours, but maybe it's its own DevOps one. We restore the key values, but you also have the ability to override them. So your deployment should get these variables, hopefully from some sort of source control, but you can put anything you want in there, like this is the environment name, I'm going to set it to UAT. That's going to do something there for it. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the other ways that you can control content. Okay, you can control content from, can be deployed to specific environments. Uh, when John was talking about your various steps, what you can say is, if I have a package, there are other ways you can control content. Uh, I can say that I want a, to make a package that is specific to my environment. This is the TDS package for debt. This is the one for UAT. This is the one for uh, prod. I skipped QA. That's okay. Uh, I can say in my deployment, no, you, you move the dev package to me. You move the QA package to me. So you're keeping those pieces in source control, but your deployments are slightly different. Same step moves a different package for a different installation. You can control it that way. Um, you can also, Unicorn works a little bit differently. It's not, you make packages, but Unicorn, you can copy specific items. Like, I set mine up, so these are my dev items, and you set it, okay? And the way that I like to do this, which we're working on, is to use the same pattern here for your content. Now, if I go back two steps, no one step. So I have this value here. It's very easy when you set a variable to update a file system file. It's not as straightforward to reach into Cycor and say, I want to set this value in this environment in Cycor. But with PowerShell, you can do that. With PowerShell, I can set a variable here. And PowerShell, now you have to set three variables. You have to know what the Cycor item is. 
what the field is, and what the value is you want to set it. But in PowerShell, you can say, okay, I'm in UAT, this is the, this is the value I want to set for that particular piece. And in PowerShell, you can, Sycor has, uh, uh, has an API you can call using PowerShell. Uh, you can update, and then when you go through your development process, you have updated not only the file system, but the Sycor content so that you can set those variables and you can control it. It's all in your source control. You can all look at when it was deployed. You can all see the variables that you set in there and you eliminate all of that guesswork. You eliminate the copy and paste. You eliminate the going and manually fixing things and you know where all of your code is and you know what you're pointing to. And that's, that's you know, the ideal situation to get to from those pieces. And I think I'm done right now. And I'll let John finish with no time left. So, Quick question. Okay. Does, yes. The cycle track, you know, the activity of the user, like all those settings. Is there like a, a log where you can track what? Has no. Been this is a so you're talking about the cycle telling you updated items because this is really more about this isn't about the user. This is about. So, so question. Sure. So what if, for instance, what, what if I put the link to the wrong link, that's the UAT, but I actually put the QA link you know, the QA uh, URL or those settings that I make. And if I have some issue, like the, the, data, the data that it's pointing to is, is the database is the wrong one. Now, if I have a log of what has happened, you can use that for troubleshooting, right? Or you could, so, in, in this case, in VSDS, if you, so one, it's kind of a complicated uh, question to ask, because it kind of depends. You're going to know when you do a release or a deployment in any of these systems, if you have variables set, you could go back and look at it and you could see the variables that yeah. you set for that release. So you can see whether or not you set the wrong ones. Sitecore, from like a troubleshooting perspective, uh, if you put, like, I don't know, there, if, if I put the wrong solar IP and it can't connect to it, solar's going to throw it an error. It's going to say, I can't connect to this thing, I don't know what you're talking about. And so you go and you look at it and, and then the first thing you can do is say, okay, it has an error here. What variable did I set? And we, we have that problem. People, I mean, Humans type in things. We've had problems in these deployments using a screenshot there where somebody forgot like one letter of something when they typed it in and it blows up. And you're like, well, wait a minute, why can't it connect to this thing? And you go and you look at the variable, you're like, oh, that's because you added an extra character there and you go and you fix it. So, um, but it is, now, when you're talking about updating Cycor items, Cycor does actually have a log of the things. So if you want to blame somebody, you can tell who updated it. It's totally in there somewhere. Um, all right, so let me let John finish the part. So, so this is an, ad 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 wow. an addendum. Um, we're eight <laughs> minutes over. So if we can can pass yeah, on this, or I can try to do it in five minutes. I'll do it with you. Ready? I'll take five minutes. Yeah. Oh, sure. OK. So just to kind of wrap up a little bit, we you know we talked about the old way things were, the way environments were. Um, talked about kind of the new approach to environments, uh, the tools we use, build the deployment process, the configuration issues we run into. Um, so this is just a quick little overview, and um, it's funny. So so Britt and I are both working on very similar DevOps type processes in very very different circumstances. My deployment is all PaaS, all Azure, everything. His is uh, all, it's in the cloud, but it's more of an IaaS, like, you know, virtual machine approach. So, um, <clears throat> this is uh, something that I uh, had to do a little redaction there, because it's an actual something we're going to order here. But uh, if, if you've built anything of Sitecore, you've probably put together something like this, where you have uh, a processing server, a couple of CD servers, a CM server, you've got Mongo down here doing stuff and, and whatever. And I joke that in the old days, you could just do a CM server and CD server and you're good to go. Or shoot, you could do just a yeah, server. We, we, with our first one, we had one. Yeah, yeah, so you could do a server. And then along the way, Sarker said, yeah, you know what, we're going to pull out reporting, and then we can pull out processing, and we can pull out publishing, and we can give you a little bit more flexibility and scalability and whatnot. Just to give you an example of, of where we're, we're going to, so this is a production environment for a, a and it's, a, it's a appropriately designed for a current client that has this is what it looks like right here. And you can see there's some, here's the SQL server down here. Um, it's a single solar, they're moving to federated solar, um, the Mongo cluster, and you can't see the top of a couple things, there's a little balancer up here, but uh, this is a, a fair representation of a production environment. You might have three CDs or four or five or whatever, but um, just an example, here is what the Azure Cycle 9 scaled environment looks like, and I couldn't even fit it quite all on the page as well. Um, and this is the recommended 
setup that Sycor has, which basically means, whereas before I could have a CD server and a CM server, and maybe I split out recording and processing and whatnot, basically, they have an Azure App Service for CD, for CM, for processing, for reporting, for XConnect, for search, for collection, for marketing, and on and on and on. So those are all, those actually come out of the box with nine app services, 10 if you're using DDS. Um, out of the box, they automatically spin up an uh, instance of Redis for caching sessions. Um, and then of course you have some different kind of solo databases along with some mixtures and whatnot. Um, what you can see up off here too is actually the Cycle 9 now comes with Azure Search. A lot of people that have Cycle for a long time, their Wisp View Solar are like, oh, like what's the Azure Search? You know, so um, I mean, that almost that exact reaction. But um, the really cool thing and the where this kind of ties back into the CI CD process, what we what I've actually built on the current project, and I just stole this slide from Microsoft, so I just kind of popped that on there, so it looks good. But um, um, you can write what they call an ARM template and just trying to get this to 30 seconds, is a, a, a JSON file that has all of the instructions and variables and such that, that you can build from a PowerShell script. I can type build, and it'll take this JSON file, send it to Azure Resource Manager in the cloud, and completely build all of this without touching it in probably about 40 minutes-ish. So basically, I can come in and I can say, oh, my dev environment crashed, and I don't know why. I can run one script wait 40 minutes and I have a completely brand new set up environment. Um, and we have that for all the five environments I showed you. And we have a CI CD process for the environment where I can go in and say, um, you know, I'm gonna update my ARM template because I only have one CD, but I want to load balance it across two. I can literally change to two, hit save, CI DC process runs, it reruns the ARM template. The ARM template says, oh, wait a minute, I've noticed a change, now you want two CD servers. It updates that in the cloud and then you're up and running. So that's a cool thing. So if I come in and decide I want to, um, you know, collapse three of these processes down to one because we're not really using it and it costs money for that, then I can do all of that from these ARM templates from a true CI/CD build. I'm not going out and clicking things or changing stuff. Now you can set scaling parameters, you know, to have happen dynamically, but um, for that. so. Um, this is just a little bit, this is the last slide, thank goodness, right? Um, this is the thing right here. So one of the things a little bit different is that um, with the Azure 9 PaaS, you're deploying to an Azure SQL instance. Um, you're using Azure App Instances instead of like a virtual machine with, with IIS. Um, the recommendation by default is Azure Search. If you use Solar, then you, you can. It's, it's very easy. It's like literally one line in a parameter file. But then you're not true Azure PaaS because you have to have a Solar cluster somewhere from there. So. Um, out of the box, you have Application Insights enabled and hooked into the app running from there. I uh, showed you Redis that's, that we have it there. Um, there are ways to do hybrid implementations. So you can have a Sitecore 9 on-prem installation and then spin up XConnect in uh, like an Azure Cloud instance. That for whatever reason, you just want to have scalability with that, but you weren't really worried about the, the scalability of the website or for whatever reason uh, from there. So, all right, did I do that in, in five minutes? <laughs> so, anyway, less than five. So, so the last thing I'll show you, actually, ah, hold on, hold on. Ah, 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 if you want, if you want to play with this, so the last thing I'll show you is this guy. Um, there is a site. There is a um, Azure has a Sitecore Marketplace module, and you can come out. I kind of pre-did this. You can pick Sitecore Nine Update Two. I want to do XP. Um, I want to do the Developer, which is the smaller version, or the Scale, which is the big one I showed you. Um, and then there's some optional like web forms for marketers that you can add into that. So you can click that, hit add, and it's not a managed ARM template, but you'll have a whole build thing. And if you have like the MSDN, like the, the free subscription or whatever, or if you have some IT dollars you can spend on that, you can build your own and just start playing around with it. Okay, now I'm done. Yay. <laughs>